you are welcome. Whether you worship regularly with us or whether you've just stumbled across this service online. Because God welcomes you to come to him. He loves you, he knows you, and you're precious to him. My name is Helen and I'll be leading us this morning. We'll follow a similar format to recent weeks. There'll be some prayers to begin with. We'll have a reading or two from the Bible, a short talk, time to pray for others. I hope that although we're all sitting in our own homes, some on our own, you'll have a sense of being with others, worshipping together, and we'll know that his spirit, the spirit of Jesus, is here with us. Before we pray, I'd like to just share a, a picture that I saw, a cartoon picture that I saw last week. There was a man looking very perplexed. He was looking at a bird cage, sort of old fashioned, ornate cage. And the bird was there, but it was sitting on top of the cage, outside the cage, inside the cage behind the closed door was a black cat. The cartoon was illustrating what is being termed assumption reversal. In other words, having to completely rethink things. Now, just at the moment in lockdown, we're all having to rethink things, even if it's just how we get our food shopping. But I'd like to suggest that it's not a bad time to be rethinking other things in our lives. Maybe reconsidering or considering for the first time whether Jesus is of any relevance or not. So let's just start by being quiet and I'd like to use this prayer. As I enter prayer now, I pause to be still. To breathe slowly. To recenter my scattered senses upon the presence of God. Words from Isaiah chapter 40. Do you not know? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He will not grow tired or weary, and his understanding no one can fathom. He gives strength to the weary and increases the power of the weak. Even youths grow tired and weary, and young men stumble and fall. But those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. Let's now say the Lord's Prayer. Use a version or a language with which you are most familiar. Or use this version, which you will see on the screen. And take your time. After the Lord's Prayer, you may like to click on the link to listen to a song that we often sing at our church. 
It reminds us of the events of Easter, but it looks forward with great hope and joy at what is to come. But firstly, the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. A time for new things. During this coronavirus pandemic, life is certainly very uncertain, as it was in the first century in the Eastern Mediterranean. Disease, food shortages, political unrest, conflicting ideologies, displaced peoples, soil degradation are not new. In recent months in our Sunday morning services we've been looking at the Book of Acts and tracing the very beginnings of the Christian Church. It's been set mainly in and around Jerusalem in tight-knit Jewish communities. In the coming months we're moving into a new phase, that of Paul's missionary journeys, an exciting one. And God is doing new things. Before we read the Bible passage, let's just set the scene. AD 40, Antioch, Syria, some 300 miles north of Jerusalem, but a world away. A vibrant cosmopolitan city of over half a million people. Extremes of wealth, buzzing commercial centre and port. The New York of its day, I guess. For several years, the Christian church had been growing steadily, largely because of the influx of believers in Jesus who had fled persecution following the death of Stephen. They'd arrived without homes, without jobs or security, but they were making a life for themselves in Antioch. But there were Gentiles too, many of them Greeks from a completely different culture and worldview, and they'd come to believe in Jesus. Steve will read from Acts 13, and I love the earthy language of the message version. Barnabas, Saul and Dr. Know-it-all. The congregation in Antioch was blessed with a number of prophet preachers and teachers, Barnabas, Simon, nicknamed Niger, Lucius the Cyrenian, Manian, an advisor to the ruler Herod, Saul. One day as they were worshipping God, they were also fasting as they waited for guidance, and the Holy Spirit spoke. Take Barnabas and Saul and commission them for the work I have called them to do. So they commissioned them, in that circle of intensity and obedience of fasting and praying, they laid hands on their heads and sent them off. Sent off on their new assignment by the Holy Spirit, Barnabas and Saul went down to Seleucia and caught a ship for Cyprus. The first thing they did when they put it at Salamis was preach God's word in the Jewish meeting places. They had John along to help out as needed. They travelled the length of the island and at Paphos came upon a Jewish wizard who had worked himself into the confidence of the governor, Sergius Paulus, an intelligent man and not easily taken in by charlatans. The wizard's name was Bar-Jesus. 
and he was as crooked as a corkscrew. The governor invited Barnabas and Saul in, wanting to hear God's word firsthand from them, but Dr. Know-it-all, which is the wizard's name in plain English, stirred up a ruckus trying to divert the governor from becoming a believer. But Saul, or Paul, full of the Holy Spirit and looking him straight in the eye said, you bag of wind, you parody of a devil. Why, you stay up at night inventing schemes to cheat people out of God, but now you've come up against God himself and your game is up. You are about to go blind. No sunlight for you for a good long stretch. And he was plunged immediately into a shadowy mist and stumbled around, begging people to take his hand and show him the way. And when the governor saw what had happened, he became a believer full of enthusiasm over what they were saying about the master. Let's start by considering what sort of church community this was. Did you spot the names of the leaders in verse one? They're quite a mixed bunch. A couple of North Africans, a government employee, a very religious Jewish Pharisee, Saul or Paul, plus Barnabas, who was actually called Joseph. He was one of the church leaders in Jerusalem, but he'd gone to Antioch to help especially the new converts. So Barnabas was his nickname, meaning encourager. And this is what we read about Barnabas in Acts 11. When Barnabas saw the wonderful things God was doing, he was filled with excitement and joy and encouraged the believers to stay close to the Lord, whatever the cost. He was kindly, full of the Holy Spirit and strong in faith. As a result, large numbers of people were added to the Lord. He'd actually stayed on in Antioch and later enlisted Paul to help him. I imagine that people in the church felt really supported and much loved as a result of his inspiration and his dedication. So, when Barnabas and Paul were clearly called to a new task, it was a collaborative process. The church leaders were worshipping together and a team of two was identified. It wasn't a case of either man seeking celebrity status or doing his own thing. There'd come a point when Paul and Barnabas, two of the most able, gifted and experienced of the church leaders, set off on their pioneering work. And it sounds as though there was no hesitation on their part to go, neither on the part of the church to let them go. Secondly, it's striking that in spite of the growing realisation that the gospel of Jesus really was for everyone and not just for the Jews, this is actually the first record we have of any intentional evangelistic mission to the Gentiles. Now, read the earlier chapters of Acts to check me out. I must say, I wonder why it had taken so long, because it had taken 10 years for Paul, or Saul as he was then, to get to this point, having met the risen Jesus on the road to Damascus and received his commission to take the gospel to the Gentiles. Anyway, this mission marked a new way of working. And in fact, Paul was to travel extensively for the remainder of his life, leading teams and setting a pattern of establishing faith communities. He was a true pioneer. God delights 
and do new things. The theme for this year's Spring Harvest Conference was Unleashed. One of the speakers said this, The Holy Spirit is no respecter of boundaries. We're cramped in our homes and in our weakness, God is doing a new thing. Food for thought. Social analysts are describing a global pandemic of fear caused by COVID-19. I wonder, does a Christian perspective bring a God's eye view? I wonder what you think of this. Canon Andrew White describes his experiences of living in the 1980s in Baghdad in very, very frightening times. He writes, At St George's we begin every service with the words in Arabic, God is here and his Holy Spirit is here. He goes on, but we need not live in fear because God is present with us at all times. We have to see things as God sees them and allow him to work through us to accomplish that which in human terms is impossible. People need hope. A 2018 survey of Generation Z, under 24 year olds, not my generation sadly, revealed that they seek, above all else, authenticity. People to be genuine and straightforward without pretense. They're also opening open to finding out about Jesus. I don't think that description is only describing Generation Z. So let us be authentic people, ready to share our faith, but also acknowledging our struggles and questions. For God is doing new things. Finally, let's continue with the story. Paul and Barnabas with John Mark travel west across Cyprus, apparently without incident. There were already Jewish believers and communities, and Paul went first to visit the local synagogues a pattern he followed in all his missions. It was in Paphos that the drama happened. The self-styled chief priest Bar Jesus was no law-abiding Jew, but a false prophet. Such people were not uncommon in the ancient world. He may even have been employed as a private wizard by Sergius Paulus, Roman governor of the region. Maybe Sergius Paulus had some respect for Judaism. Anyway, he was interested to meet these visitors. Paul, full of the Holy Spirit, is given a clear insight into the deception of this bar Jesus, this charlatan. The result? Sergius Paulus sees the power of God for himself and believes. It looks like Paul's special calling was starting to be fulfilled. Looking back over his 12 years of missionary travels and writings, Paul wrote this. It has always been my ambition to preach the gospel where Christ was not known. 
God had certainly started doing new things. I'd like us to consider two questions. You may like to ask yourself these questions now, but reflect and maybe discuss them in the coming week. Firstly, Christianity is, in essence, openness to the person of Jesus Christ. Am I open to knowing more of Jesus whom Paul knew and loved? And secondly, if God is doing a new thing, where would you like to see God's power unleashed today? Where in your workplace, your community, your family, your church? Now, let us spend a few moments praying for others. The following prayers are based on topics for Christian Aid and the Baptist Union for May 2020. After each statement, please bring to the Lord individuals or situations that you have a particular concern for. Let us pray. Love never fails. Even in the darkest moments, love gives hope. Lord, we especially pray for bereaved families that we know. Love compels us to fight against coronavirus alongside our sisters and brothers living in poverty. Lord, we bring before you those we may know who are living and working amongst the poorest of the poor. Keep them safe and may your joy be their strength. Love compels us to stand together in prayer with our neighbours near and far. Lord, give us opportunities to offer hope and to serve those we encounter in our daily, albeit restricted, lives. Love compels us to give and act as one. Now it is clear that our futures are bound together more tightly than ever before. Lord, we pray for all farmers worldwide, especially those struggling with limited opportunities to export livestock and other produce. Be with them as they struggle with the financial impact of the current situation. May they and their families get the help and support they need. And as we pray in our individual homes, around the nation and around the world, we are united as one family. So let us pause and find a moment of peace as we lift up our hearts together in prayer. In Jesus' name. Amen. I'd like to read a blessing using the words of Paul to the church in Philippi. Do not be anxious about anything. 
but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, bring your requests to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put it into practice. And the God of peace will be with you. Have a good week.